Stewart, one of Hollywood's best-loved actors. He starred in an amazing number of films that today are considered to be true classics. He won an Oscar in 1940 for his role in The Philadelphia Story. His easy manner and warm, relaxed style endeared him to audiences across the world. Stewart became a favorite of some of cinema's most celebrated directors, like Frank Capra, Anthony Mann, and of course, Alfred Hitchcock. As well as being an international star, Stewart had a noted military career, reaching the rank of Brigadier General in the US Air Force Reserve during World War II. His first film after the war was one of his best, and it opened the discussion with Joan Bakewell at the National Film Theatre in 1972. It's a Wonderful Life. I believe it's your favourite movie. Yes, I think so. Uh, I don't exactly know why. I, I, it just reminded me of uh, a time when Frank Capra told me the idea of it. I, it's the first picture I did after I got out of the service. And Frank called me one day and he said, I, I have an idea for a movie. Why don't you come over to the house and I'll tell you it. So I came over and we sat down and he said, now, this picture starts in heaven. And that shook me. <laughs> and uh, he said, you're in terrible trouble and you uh, are about to commit suicide and uh, by jumping off a bridge. And an angel comes down uh, and he uh, tries to save you, but he can't swim. So you save him. And then, and then Frank got, got uh, a little mixed up. And uh, he said, this sounds terrible, doesn't it? <laughs> and I said, Frank, if you want to do a picture that starts in heaven where I have a guardian angel, I'm your boy. And uh, that's the way it started. Let's go back to how it really started for James Stewart, because your father had a hardware store in Indiana, Pennsylvania, so it wasn't in the family line of business for you to become an actor. And I understand that your, in a sense, your parents were never reconciled to the fact that you were an actor. They never quite approved, did they? No, my mother approved. My father just, uh, he, he didn't accept the idea of uh, being an actor, my being an actor. And I think that's the reason he kept the hardware store uh, in operation, <laughs> because I've, I'm, I'm pretty sure that he felt that I was going to be found out <laughs> sooner or later, and he wanted to have a job for me to come back to. <laughs> But he, uh, he nonetheless was quite pleased when you won an Oscar because didn't he find it of use in his business? Yes, I, the, the day, the, the night uh, that I won the Oscar, he called me very late and uh, said that he thought it was fine and that I should send it back to the hardware store <laughs> and he'd put it on the knife counter. <laughs> and uh, that's what I did, and it stayed there for, oh, 20 years, under a cheese bell. <laughs> you, you, you joke about it, but he sounds a fairly formidable parent and some considerable opposition to your becoming an actor. In fact, you went to Princeton University and took a degree in architecture, and your friend Henry Fonda says that you are really an actor in spite of yourself, that in fact you were set on an architectural career, and the acting was an accident. Can you tell us about that? Well, I suppose in a way it was an accident. Uh, I was going to be an architect. I, uh, I graduated with a degree in architecture, and I had a scholarship to go back to Princeton and get my master's in architecture, and I'd I'd done theatricals in college, but I, 
I had done them because it was fun. Uh, and then I was asked up to a stock company that was run by Josh Logan and Bertain Windust and Myron McCormick and Margaret Sullivan, Henry Fonda. I was asked uh, uh, to come up for the summer, not to act, but to play my accordion. I, w I played the accordion <laughs> in a tea room next to the theater. <laughs> and I lasted one night. Uh, my, they, they said my playing uh, spoiled people's appetites. <laughs> And then they gave me various jobs as a prop man and as uh, small parts, and I was offered a very small part in a play going to New York. So the time came to go back to college, and I just felt that having this tiny little part in a play on Broadway, it just seemed to me to be a lot more exciting than going back to school. Uh, and that's sort of the way it started. In 1935, you went to Hollywood. MGM offered you a contract. What, what was it like arriving from Broadway, not really sure that you'd given up architecture even by this time? What, what impression did it make on you? No, it was very exciting right from the start. You were doing tiny little parts in big pictures with stars like Myrna Loy and Bill Powell and and then you would get a big part in a tiny little picture that they also made. Uh, in the meantime, you were learning your craft by acting, which I've always thought is the only way you can learn. In fact, you were often working on several films at the same time. Yeah, I was working on five at once one time. How hard. did you know which you were playing? Well, it was pretty hard. To, I had to keep, uh, get, uh, I had to be briefed every once in a while. <laughs> In those days, the big studios would trade you like they trade ball players. Uh, you, you would be traded uh, to another studio, maybe for another actor, or you would be traded for a, 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 a script, or perhaps uh, you would be traded and the other studio would be allowed to use that studio's back lot for a while. You know. <laughs> what did they trade you for? I don't know. They, they said by well, one time they traded me for uh, seven horses, <laughs> seven stunt horses. <laughs> You've appeared in several biographical films, of course. You've played Glenn Miller and you played Lindbergh. Is it more difficult to be convincing and, and natural in them? How do you approach that kind of part? You, you have to make a thing believable without using the device of acting. And I, that doesn't make any sense at all. But uh, I've, I've sort of, over the years, I've developed a theory. I'm getting to believe that in, in films, what everybody is striving for is to produce moments not a performance, not a characterization, not something that you get into the part and it's... Uh, you, you produce moments that create a feeling of believability to what you're doing. Now, the moments sometimes don't work. Sometimes it doesn't go... Uh, it, 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 nothing happens. William Wyler has always, always been uh, uh, very famous for taking a lot of takes. And uh, there's the story that he had had this scene with a, a bunch of very competent people, a b very important scene in the movie, and he'd already d done it 30 times. And one of them came and said, Willie, I, 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 wa I want to know what we're doing wrong. What, what, what do you want us to do now? I, I don't know what... And Willie said, no, you're doing it fine. I'm just waiting for something to happen. <laughs> and that's what I mean by creating moments. 
I, 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 another thing that happened over the years that bears this out is that people will come up to me and say, uh, boy, I, I, I like that picture you did. Uh, now, now, they won't remember the name of the picture. They won't remember where they saw it. They won't remember who was in it or who directed it. But they said, you know that picture? You were in this room. <laughs> and uh, you were some kind of a lawyer. Or something, and uh, th this fellow was over there, and he turned to you, and he said, and I forget what he said, but you, you looked at him, and boy, that look, that was some look you gave. <laughs> And, and a great many times, you remember that moment too. And you thought it was pretty good. Every once in a while. I remember, I remember just while I'm on this, I, in this moment thing, I, I was making a picture in British Columbia, Western. And we were on the uh, Columbia ice fields. And it was raining, and there was heavy mist around, and we couldn't shoot, so we were all huddled around a fire. And suddenly, out of the mist came a man. And he was not a young man, and he had a beard. It wasn't exactly a beard, he just hadn't shaved for a while. And he was uh, sort of a minor type, a, was dressed like a minor. And he came closer to us, and he said, which one of you fellows is Stuart? And I said, I am. And he came over and looked at me, and he said, oh, yeah, 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 now I recognize you. He said, well, I heard you was here, and I thought I'd come up and say hello. I, uh, I've seen a lot of your pictures, picture shows, he called them. He said, but I think the one I like best, you were in this room. <laughs> And, uh, and your girlfriend was in the next room, and um, there were fireflies outside. And uh, you recited a piece of poetry to her. And I thought that was a nice thing for you to do. <laughs> and I remembered exactly the moment and exactly the film. I remembered who was in it and who directed it. And I also realized that that picture had been released 20 years before. And it, it made a tremendous impression on me, that man, to think that, that I had been part of creating a moment that this man had liked and had remembered for 20 years. And I'll never forget it. This, uh, this is what I mean by the moment. Mm. Magic moments in cinema was a favorite theme of Stewart's, and he returned to that in an interview with Mike Parkinson in 1973. <laughs> but it was his distinctive way of talking that got the conversation started. What about this unmistakable voice of yours? Because going back to the Screen Awards, you got two ovations. You're the only man I've known in the history of, uh, of television who got two ovations. You got one when you walked on, and you got one when you said, wow. I mean, it was, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was absolutely extraordinary, but true. I mean, it's, it's the voice, it's not acquired, it's, it's natural, is it? It's always been with you. Always, always been with me. <laughs> <laughs> in that form. Yes, I don't, uh, I don't ever remember trying to change it, except perhaps in, in the, when I played Lindbergh. I tried to r raise the voice, maybe, because he has a very high voice and he talks very fast. And he talks like that, and, he, and, and uh, he's very definite, you know, and he, doesn't, uh, and he doesn't hem and haw the way I do. <laughs> so I tried, to, I tried to get it. Uh, uh, I don't know if, uh, whether I did or not, but I, that's what I tried to do. <laughs> Did, did anybody ever suggest at any time that you should have your voice trained? That you should go to a voice specialist or something? And... Well, not exactly the, the training in the voice, but I remember... Oh, dear. <laughs> I remember uh, I was in a play 
in New York, I played an Austrian nobleman. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's it's uh, give me a, a little idea that I needed the work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I felt I did need the work, and I, but it was a play, uh, very sad, terrible, sad, tragic play, uh, with a young girl by the name of Greta Marin, who the Schuberts had brought over. But I, I somehow felt that I, I should give some suggestion of an Austrian accent of some kind. And there was a woman in New York in those days by the name of Frances Robinson Duff, who taught drama, who taught voice, who, who uh, people would go to uh, when they got apart, and she would coach them sort of uh, mostly in voice and mostly in projection and so on. And I went to Ms. Duff, and this was tough going, you know, it was five bucks a throw uh, <laughs> for the le lessons, but I felt that this was important. And she said, yes, I'll, I, I, think I, can, uh, I think we can work out some kind of a, a suggestion of an ad. But after three uh, lessons, she called me in and she said, uh, I'm going to have to let you go. <laughs> said, I, uh, there's no way I can teach you uh, uh, an Austrian accent. She said, but any time in the future that you feel that you'd like to learn to speak English properly. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, uh... do, do you remember the first part you played? Yeah, Murder Man. It, it, it was a, I, I was taken up to the producer and uh, the fellow, a very good friend of mine, the casting director of MGM, Billy Grady, who was really responsible for getting me out into the movies. And he said, I, here's a fellow Stuart, and he's, I thought maybe he'd be good for the part of Shorty. <laughs> and the producer said, but look, the fellow's 12 feet tall. How, how, how do you want Shorty? And uh, Bill said, well, maybe, well, I thought maybe he might change the name. And the producer said, well, now you want to, you want to rewrite the script, too. You know? and I, so I, uh, I got the part, man, but I was still shorty. You were still shorty. And uh, if you winked, you missed me in that one. You were just a tiny... <laughs> what about yourself in that period? Because you were, you were thin now, aren't you? You must have been very skinny then. Did they ever try and sort of build you up into some kind of virile sex symbol, you know? muscles and everything. Well, they had, a fellow, they had a fellow at MGM by the name of Don Loomis, who was a weightlifter. And I'd, I went up for a part to somebody, and they said, go down to Don Loomis and put on 20 pounds. Well, I, I haven't put on 20 pounds for 20 years. I, I, uh, but I went down to Don Loomis, and he looked, and he said, well, we have to start from scratch here. <laughs> with so I, but I got hooked on this. <laughs> I got hooked on this weightlifting thing, and he had all the health foods, blackstrap molasses, and, all, and I did all this, and I did all the weightlifting, and I, I, I found myself for the first time in my life in the morning and, and, and doing this, and the muscle came, by, and I'm looking, and I, all this, and, I, and, and I, I couldn't wear my shirts anymore. I had to get new shirts, and I got uh, uh, bigger around here. I had to get... Uh, uh, another suit, I, I, uh, and all, all this, and I, I, I did it for over a year. Uh, I didn't get the part that I, <laughs> but I got uh, stronger. But uh, finally, one day, when I'd gotten to lift really heavy weights, really heavy, and had gotten very good, I, I finally put it down. I said, I can't do this anymore. I thought, this is mechanical thing. There's something wrong. I, I can't do this anymore. And in three weeks, I was back to 130 pounds, and I, and I had to get a new shirt, a shirt <laughs> and change the whole thing. So uh, the, uh, th that idea of uh, sort of uh, changing my uh, bill didn't, didn't work. No. So pursued by the ladies, were you, in the early days? Well... Uh... <laughs> You speak freely on this program. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I, I, it was fun being a bachelor. <laughs>
You had, in fact, a very distinguished uh, uh, war record. You went right the way through the war as, a, as a, an active serving officer. But what, what kind of um, welcome did you get when you got back home, Jimmy? Well, it was fine, very quiet. I, I went, uh, first thing I saw, uh, someone had, had written, Welcome home, Jim, on a sheet and put it up in the courthouse. And I could see it from my, my home in Indiana. And there were a lot of people uh, came to see me, and I went down to the hardware store and walked up Main Street and said hello to a lot of people. There was a man, a uh, photographer from Life magazine, by the name of Peter Stackpole, and he was there taking pictures, and somebody said, uh, now, is there anything else you would do the first, that you would want to do? Would you go fishing? And uh, I said, uh, yes. But I must have said it in a way that gave them the impression that I had missed fishing all these four years, that I had, had kept receiving the magazine Field and Stream all through through it. And I really wasn't that much of a fisherman, but I found myself in a boat with Woody Woodward, who worked for my father, and Peter Stackpole, and we were uh, plug casting for bass out in a little lake outside of town. And I hadn't done it for a long time, and I kept getting backlashes. So then the, Peter was trying to get a picture of me, at least getting a cast off. In the meantime, Woody pulled in a couple of bass. I still was getting backlashes. And Peter said, well, I think we have enough. The, the, let's, uh, let's go home. Uh, this is all right. I have enough. I said, no, one more time. I want, I, I've got it all right. And I, 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 and I hooked it on something. And I looked, I'd, I'd hooked Peter Stackpole. <laughs> here. And he said, uh, let's, let's go home. Let's, <laughs> let's go home. So we went home. And then there were people for dinner. And uh, it was a full day. It was a full day. But after everybody uh, went home, and after my sisters and my mother went upstairs, my father sat down in his favorite chair in the living room. And uh, he said, now sit down. And I, he said, now tell me, tell me, wh what was it like? And I said, well, I, uh, I flew my crew down to South America, and then I went over to Dakar, and then getting up to uh, England, have to, had to wait in Marrakesh for a while because of weather. And uh, then we finally got, uh, and I looked, and he was fast asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, he never asked me very much about it anymore. <laughs> Real heroes welcome. Yeah. What about the getting back into movies? Because you started with a bang, didn't you? With a marvelous movie made by uh, Frank Capra. It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, how, did, how did that? I mean, did you want to get back into the movies? Oh, or? I certainly did. Yeah. But I. Uh, it was sort of a, a, a nebulous period. Uh, in my career because I, I didn't exactly know whether the type of thing that I'd done before, yeah, yeah. whether that would be accepted. And it turned out that it wasn't very accepted. That's, uh, it's a Wonderful Life didn't do very well. Didn't it? And I, the next picture didn't do very well. And it, it was sort of falling back on that, on that sort of thing that I'd gotten into, the romantic comedy, and the people didn't want that. Yeah. Stuart was back with Parkinson. Now, age 69, his big screen appearances were increasingly rare. But people still love to hear him talking about his life, his work, and his adventures in Hollywood. These are the great days in Hollywood, weren't they? In the sort of 30s or so, when the industry, the film industry, was Hollywood. What do you remember when you think back, uh, Jimmy, over the many, many years that, that you've been there and been a star there? You mean a, a well, what was it like when you in the 30s when you were there, for instance? I mean, the, the studio system was going, wasn't it? Well, the whole thing was so uh, was, was so exciting, and the whole uh, idea. They say there was a certain magic about it. Well, I, I agree with that. Uh, the idea of being I, I was a, a contract player at MGM when I came from the New York stage and. Uh, the idea of being on the lot where pictures were being made with Greta Garbo and Jean Harlow and uh, uh, Lionel Barrymore and Myrna Loy and William Powell and the 
Wallace Berry and uh, all, all these people that you'd see every once in a while. I, uh, uh, everything, everything was excitement. You know, it was like a family and uh, it seemed that the whole town, everybody would gather at a wonderful nightclub, the Trocadero. And uh, we worked six days a week then. And Saturday night, we'd all collect at the Trocadero, and uh, it was an all-night affair. And everybody performed. I remember one night, a little girl got up and said, That's a, and her mother was with her, with pigtails and bobby socks on. And a little girl got up and said, hey, here's a uh, little girl that uh, MGM has just signed, and their mother brought her down once she wants to sing a song. She started to sing, and she sang for an hour. There was a little, she was 14, I think, 13, 14, 15, Judy Garland. First time, anybody, and it was magic. Did she have the magic then? Then, she had it really? absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You mentioned a name there, of course, of one of the greatest sort of sex symbols of all time, Jean Harlow. Now, you worked with her, didn't you? Yes, I was in a picture with her uh, called Wife versus Secretary. I had a very small part, uh, but I, I was sort of the boy next door, and we had uh, uh, been through high school together and everything, but uh, then uh, Gable was also in the picture, so you, you know, the, the sort of... But we had one scene, uh, one scene in the car, and uh, it was sort of uh, uh, the uh, goodbye scene. She uh, was interested in uh, other things and sort of saying goodbye to me. And uh, I had most of the dialogue because I was trying to uh, tell her my story and plead with her to stay with me and everything. So I. And of course, I had had months to learn it, so I knew it very well, and I, and I, I did it. And the scene ended with a kiss. Now, this was at night. We, we, we worked at night and all, all times, and she was uh, actually on another scene in the picture. And I was on a picture, another picture at night, and we met and were to do, going to do this scene. And Clarence Brown was directing, and I, we, we went, he said, well, let's uh, just do a, rehearse it. And I went through it, and, and uh, uh, it ended and with the kiss. This is a rehearsal. I'd never been kissed like that ever in my life. <laughs> I, I just I was born in Pennsylvania. <laughs> I, I, uh, and... Uh, uh, Clarence Brown, the director, said, well, that seemed all right. Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's go for a take. Uh, so we went for a take, and uh, uh, the same thing. And uh, if the last kiss, th this one was a, a real barn burner. This, this <laughs> and I, I, uh, I, uh, this took me back a little. I, I, I didn't know exactly how to tell you. But Clarence Brown saw what a good time I was having, and he said, well, why don't we, uh, why don't we do a couple more takes just to make sure? <laughs> and I spoiled the thing. I started blowing my lines, and he said, OK, we'll print that first one. <laughs> Is it difficult for you now to, to find parts? I mean, you must get offered an awful lot of rubbish, mustn't you? I, I, uh, I don't get offered much of anything. <laughs> I mean, they, uh, uh, they, they, they the, the parts, they're just not writing the parts, uh, you know, great big parts for uh, people that have been around as long as I have. You know, you, you, uh, you, I'm, I'm old. And you, they, the, the parts just uh, aren't, aren't coming like they used to. You're still a great star, though. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I just, you are a big, uh, you're a bigger star than any of these people I've coming had, through uh, today. That's for sure. The whole thing has been a wonderful life. I've been tremendously fortunate. fortunate. I've, I, I've, I've loved every minute of it, and I have a wonderful marriage, and I'm, I'm a happy man, and uh, uh, I, I consider every day gravy. <laughs> <laughs> We 
end with a classic example of why audiences love James Stewart. Here he is on The Wogan Show in 1988, wearing his heart on his sleeve, sharing a poem he'd written about his favourite pet dog, who'd recently died, whose name was Bo. I just made up my mind that I'd, I'd write about my friend Bo and try to make it rhyme. And it came out like this. He never came to me when I would call unless I had a tennis ball or he felt like it. But mostly he didn't come at all. When he was young, he never learned to heal or sit or stay. He did things his way. Discipline was not his bag, but when you're with him, things sure didn't drag. <laughs> He'd dig up a rose bush just to spite me, and when I'd grab him, he'd turn and bite me. <laughs> he bit lots of folks from day to day. The delivery boy was his favorite prey. <laughs> the gas man wouldn't read our meter. He said we owned a real man-eater. <laughs> he set the house on fire, but the story is too long to tell. But suffice to say that he survived, and the house survived as well. And on evening walks, and mom took him, he was always first out the door. The old one and I brought up the rear because our bones were sore. And he'd charge up the street with mom hanging on. What a beautiful sight they were. And if it was still light and the tourists were out, he created a bit of a stir. But every once in a while, he'd stop in his track and with a frown on his face, turn around it was just to make sure that the old one was there to follow him where he was bound. We're early to betters in our house. I guess I'm the first to retire. And as I'd leave the room, he'd look up at me and get up from his place by the fire. He knew where the tennis balls were upstairs, and I'd give him one for a while, and he'd, he'd shove it under the bed with his nose, and I'd dig it out with a smile. But before very long, he'd tire of the ball and be asleep in his corner in no time at all. And there were nights when I'd feel him climb upon our bed and lie between us, and I'd pat his head. And there were nights when I'd feel the stare, and I'd wake up, and he'd be sitting there, and I'd reach out my hand to stroke his hair, and sometimes I'd feel him sigh, and I'd think I know the reason why. He'd wake up at night, and he would have this fear of the dark, of life, of lots of things, and he'd be glad to have me near. And now he's dead. And there are nights when I think I feel him climb up upon our bed and lie between us, and I pat his head. And there are nights when I think I feel that stare, and I reach out my hand to stroke his hair, but he's not there. Oh. How I wish that wasn't so. I'll always love a dog named Bo. Uh -huh. yeah. In January 1997, James Stewart died at home, aged 89. In tributes, he was called an American national treasure and the embodiment of decency and moral courage. But his friend Doris Day possibly put it best, saying simply, Jimmy Stewart had a wonderful life.